Hello, everyone. Welcome to NKBA Live, Brave New Business. I'm Bill Darcy. It's no doubt a very difficult time for America. I hope all of you and your families and colleagues are healthy and safe, especially in light of the tragedies of these past 10 days. I'm personally heartbroken by the tragic acts of racism and social injustice. My wife and I have spent a lot of time with our three children trying to explain what's happening talking openly about the hatred and discrimination that still exists in this world. We are a baseball family, as some of you know. 42, the story of Jackie Robinson happens to be one of our uh, favorite movies. Yes, because it's baseball, but more because it's baseball teaching life lessons. In April of 1947, Jackie broke the color barrier in that sport, ending more than 50 years of segregation. His amazing courage, along with the leadership displayed by the Brooklyn Dodgers owner, Branch Rickey, was monumental for the game, for sports, and for America. Very sadly, we sit here nearly 75 years later, witnessing events that are, are difficult to process. I hope that as a nation and as a community, we come out of this with specific action that dedicates the work required to truly eliminate injustices and inequality in our country. The test for society is fundamental systemic change that must occur. I would like to offer a moment of silence for the family of George Floyd and all the victims of these horrific acts. Thank you. On the subject of change, there are a lot of changes coming to our industry. The COVID-19 pandemic certainly has challenged all of us in a year that started off very promising. And of course, this is secondary to the catastrophic loss of life and damage to the global economy. As states and businesses begin to ramp up again and a number of needs have emerged in residential design and construction, some of these concepts aren't necessarily new, but they have come into the spotlight. Today, our discussion is measuring the impact, how will home design change? And I'm happy to welcome three experts to discuss the ways our homes, kitchens and baths, and in fact, our cities will inevitably be transformed as a result of the pandemic. They'll offer some specifics about what designers and remodelers and architects are likely to be incorporating into their projects going forward. From smaller changes to large scale remodeling and new construction. Our guests are Paul Keskes, Content Director at Architizer, based in New York City. Lloyd Alter, Design Editor for Treehugger.com and Adjunct Professor of Interior Design at Ryerson University in Toronto, Canada. And Teresa Casey, Principal and Registered Interior Designer at Casey Design Planning Group, also in Toronto. As always, with just a little housekeeping, this online form qualifies for a half CEU credit for NKBA certified members. And I'd like to thank Megan Siason, AKBD, 30 Under 30 alumni, and also a 2019 design competition winner in the specialty category for living in place design, whose beautiful bathroom design you see behind me today. Speaking of the 30 Under 30 program, nominations open this week for the class of 2021. If you know an outstanding young professional in the KNB industry, you can nominate them at nkba.org. We should have some time for questions at the end. Please type those in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen not the chat, please. So Paul, let's start with you. It's fairly obvious that initial concerns surrounding the health crisis have been about keeping us safe and well. And for many people, this means working from home. As a result, we've seen many companies that are truly rethinking the need to have their entire staff returned to a physical office on a full-time basis. So speaking on a macro scale from an architectural and city planning perspective, what, can, you know, what could this mean for cities? I think you're muted, Paul. There you go. Classic Zoom. Um, <laughs> thanks, Bill. Um, sure. It might seem like a kind of a surprising place to start um, talking about home design by actually talking about offices, but but I think it could kind of reveal clues to the future at, of home design as well. So, um, yeah, if we could, could we have the first slide? Thanks. Yeah. So this is a, a screenshot from uh, from the New York Times. Um, super interesting article. Uh, Twitter could end the office as we know it. Um, I encourage everyone to to read this at some point. Um, 
the uh, head of Twitter has basically said that any employee that wants to can continue to work from home after the pandemic uh, indefinitely. Um, <clears throat> and as I was reading this, I was thinking, could this be, is this a one-off or could this be some kind of a precedent, a wider precedent for, from a, a shift away from uh, large scale offices um, to work from home? Um, so I looked into the numbers a little bit. Um, it looks like 67% of US, US GDP is, is service sector. Um, other companies extending work from home policies um, besides Twitter include JP Morgan, Facebook, Capital One, Amazon, Google, Microsoft. So these are obviously pretty large companies. Um, so we imagine um, many more companies like that uh, shifting their policies, then <clears throat> we could end up seeing huge buildings across cities like New York and LA um, suddenly finding that they have a lot of unused space, um, these skyscrapers. So um, I think that that could point towards um, a rise in adaptive reuse, um, converting office spaces into apartments, maybe even cultural uses as well. Um, and this got me thinking about another sector which has seen a, a pattern um, similar to this in the past. Could we have the second slide? This is um, Westminster Arcade in Rhode Island. This is America's oldest shopping center. Um, and it was recently converted just earlier this year. I think they, they finished this project. Um, Northeast Collaborative Architects uh, converted the mall into micro apartments. Um, <clears throat> so maybe in the long term, we'll see office spaces being converted into residences. And obviously that has, that has profound effects, uh, pr profound implications for kitchen and bath design. Um, and I also think um, similar to this, um, we may see public spaces changing in how they're used. Um, we're seeing um, more pedestrianized areas following um, lower use of cars. Um, we may see different policies around um, public amenities like public toilets and public bathrooms. Um, given that people are not going to be able to just walk in off the street into a restaurant and use use a bathroom um, potentially for safety uh, for health healthcare reasons, um, so maybe you know there's, there's going to be a growing need for um, public bathrooms with um, very robust spec um, to to cope with that that footfall. Um, so I think on the large scale, um, there are a lot of implications outside of the home, which will also ultimately affect home design too, as as people live much more of their lives at home. You know, speaking that, you know, going back to the home now with the elderly population, since nursing homes haven't been particularly hard hit, will older family members increasingly come back to living with their children? And what will that mean for home design? Yeah, I think the first thing we have to do is, as a society, is recognize that something has gone terribly wrong. With, uh, with respect to care homes during this time, um, we've seen a lot um, more um, problems with COVID in, in care homes. And I think as, as an industry, um, we need to look at why that might be and how architecture and design may have, um, may have contributed to the problems. Um, maybe the layouts of care homes um, do not aid separation between um, the carers and um, the people being cared for in those in those places, and maybe the maybe a lot of the materials in in the the homes that were built earlier in the twentieth century maybe they're out of date and they need to be upgraded at this point. Um, and then thinking a little bit more radically about about this um, issue, um, the the image on the screen is a conceptual project um, by um, Matthias Holwich um, called Skylar uh, Skylar Tower, and this was actually created. I think three years ago, so it's very much uh, pre-pandemic, um, but it explored um, the idea of cross-programming within a high-rise. Um, so it placed um, elderly, elderly people's residences and um, younger people's residences where um, they're in proximity to each other. So maybe um, younger generations could help and support older generations. Um, but also they include medical facilities in, in the same um, building. So I think you know, proximity um, of uh, the caregivers and those people to be cared for um, is something that we may see um, 
more and more of moving forwards. Um, <clears throat> obviously, with any kind of design like this, there would have to be a lot of thought given to the details and materials for um, not just the, the kitchens and bathrooms, but also um, the shared spaces, um, thinking elevators, garbage disposal um, areas, hallways, and bathroom and kitchen manufacturers being the experts in clean design and cleanliness. Um, I could even see their materials extending out, out of the kitchen, out of the bathroom, into these common areas, and those kind of high-tech, innovative materials um, being used even more widely moving forward, um, anywhere where people are sharing spaces. So I think that's, that's kind of exciting. That's, that's a, a positive side, potentially, to this whole situation. Yeah, that's, that's great stuff. Thank you, Paul. Uh, Lloyd, uh, since the COVID crisis began, wash your hands has become the new mantra. But that certainly is not a new concept. In fact, in a recent post that on Tree Hugger, you trace the origins of our obsession for sanitizing to the pre-antibiotic era just after World War I, the time of the 1918 flu pandemic. I admit, as I told you, I'm germaphobic and have been as far back as I can remember. I attribute that to the influence of two special people. One, my grandfather, who uh, sadly lost his mother, sister, and brother all at once to typhoid fever and a surgeon uncle. So you, you add those two things together and it, 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 it so influenced us that washing hands is mandatory upon entering our house and just ask my three boys. Uh, now that we've experienced another health crisis that's sharpening the focus on sanitation and sterilization again, what will the next generation of bathrooms and other spaces look like? Thanks for that. Actually, it was really more tuberculosis than the flu that drove the uh, whole change. But this is one of the most famous houses in the world, the Villa Savoie and Le Corbusier put a sink right in the front hall. You came in the door and there was the sink. And the reason was simple. His client was a doctor who was obsessed with cleanliness. And basically they had nothing to deal with tuberculosis except the same things we have today to deal with the coronavirus, which was cleanliness and chlorine bleach. And so the whole house and everything was about it, was about being clean. Next slide, please. This is actually from 1931, Le Corbusier's own apartment, his own bedroom, which really looks more like a bathroom than a bedroom. He was also in a time when the French rarely had bathrooms. Uh, his own bedroom, he had a big stall shower, a sink of his own, which is hidden behind that bookcase. And then his wife Yvonne had her own bathroom right there with a sink, a tub and a bidet right in the middle of the room there. She was embarrassed by the bidet and crocheted a cover for it, but there it was. They were all obsessed with simplicity and cleanliness. Next slide, please. Now, when I look at a bathroom catalog from about 1890, what have you got? You've got a room in which they threw a lot of fixtures. There was a fixture for everything. Some of them, I don't even know what they are. Uh, but this was basically the theory. You've got a room, you put stuff in it. Next slide, please. And when I look at these images of a bathroom of the future, it's exactly the same thing. It's a room, they've thrown some fixtures in them. Uh, they've got the toilet strangely sitting there with a computer on it. And it's exactly the same as the previous slide, except they've added a lot of monitors and turned it into a disco. Next slide, please. Actually, I, I have in my own bathroom, and I'll show this um, uh, afterwards when the slides aren't on, I'll tilt my camera so that you can see that I have a sink in the hall so that everybody can get at it every time. I have the toilet in its own little room with a bidet attachment on the toilet, uh, and I have the shower and the tub in its own little room, but never ever would I put the shower in the tub because it's the dumbest thing was, was ever designed, that you'd have a curved piece of metal and plastic soap and water that somebody has to stand in. So I think that we have to actually get back to actually having more fixtures in separate places. This is a really interesting plan of the Onion Flats in Philadelphia where the architects ISA did this to save space to get more room. But what they created was a really interesting idea. The bathroom is in fact a vestibule. You come in and you've got your toilet and your sink and a two piece. And then you've got the stall shower which is cleverly hidden by a door that swings to cover the shower or to cover the entry to your apartment. 
So in fact, what you've got is you're coming in through the bathroom. You can take off your shoes. You can throw your clothes right into the washer and dryer. You can get clean and then go into your apartment. I think every apartment and every house is going to need this kind of transition zone where you can move from the outside through the transition zone where you get clean. Bill, I'm sure you'll love this, the way you were describing your family, and then into the house. We have to actually think like Le Corbusier and go back to that sink in the hall. Get, getting more specific, and we can go right into it. Get, getting more specific about products, Lloyd. Can you tell us what products will take off and a little bit more about the solutions they'll provide? Yeah, sure. I'll take the next slide again, please. Here is a sink that was designed in 1928 by Alvar Aalto for a sanitarium in Finland. And he basically was designing the sink for health. I mean, for I think it was one of the earliest cases where hot and cold water were combined to come out of one faucet. And because you were going to be washing your hands in the stream, it would hit the back of the sink, not the bottom of the sink, so the water wouldn't splash. And it was essentially self-cleaning. And so the whole thing was designed around function, not around appearance. Next slide, please. But what's in the middle, there were two people in this room, so two sinks, is a cuspidor, a place to spit, a place to brush your teeth. Because I've never understood, and I still don't, why you would use a sink, you'd spit into the sink, if you are sick, everything's coming out of your mouth into your sink, and then you wash in the sink. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that's very similar to flushing their toilet and washing your hands in it after. Uh, next slide. You know, dentists, all kinds of, they, they used to, all the manufacturers used to have a separate tooth sink. I've seen plans of old bathrooms where there was a special sink for just doing that. The dentist sinks, when you use them, the water automatically rinses it as it goes around. It's like an incredibly sensible design. And I don't know why we don't have things like this in our houses. We need a complete range, I think, of appliances that actually serve the function. Next slide, please. This is in fact a new toilet release that I just saw at a trade show when I was in Portugal in December uh, that actually has no rim, no place to get dirt under the rim. The water splashes out from the back, runs right around, cleans the whole bowl. The whole thing is designed to be spotless and easy to clean. And of course it's wall mounted, which in Europe, almost all toilets are, and which makes total sense because then you can just clean under the whole thing. Next slide. I think we have to start thinking of our bathrooms as if, frankly, they're hospital bathrooms, that everything is easily washed, all the taps may be touch free. Um, I used to use those elbow operated ones in the first bathroom I designed for myself, but now, you know, we may all be just talking in and having Siri turn on the water or, or Alexa do this or that. Uh, designing for cleanliness, designing for safety more than anything else. You see all those new tubs, the fashionable tubs with the very, very thin walls. Well, if you're old, how do you get into a tub usually? You sit in the edge and you swing your legs around. Now we've designed, everybody's putting in these freestanding tubs with thin walls you can't sit on, a few inches away from the wall so you can't clean behind them, nowhere to put a handlebar to, for safety. Uh, everybody falls in love with the look of this stuff and it isn't cleanable, it isn't practical, it isn't even safe. Uh, we have to go back and think like that old plumber again, think about health and sanitation and cleanliness and being able to use it when we get older. Very interesting stuff. Very interesting stuff, Lloyd. Thank you. Uh, Teresa, um, you know, obviously we're talking about the bathroom here. Can you pivot to the kitchen? Um, what are some of the impacts of the virus on kitchen design going forward and some specific types of products that will help us in the kitchen? Well, thanks, Bill. Um, I think this time has forced all of us to look at our homes uh, in a new light um, and look at how they function and how they look. And I see a keen desire from my clients for their homes to nurture them and more so now than ever. And I think this is especially true of our kitchens, which I still believe is the heart of the home. Um, I think as industry experts, we're going to be asked to include a number of new uh, key functions um, because of the COVID situation. And I think one of those uh, first ones would be flexibility in the space. Um, secondly, and ability to have multi-person usage of a kitchen, um, a focus on hygiene, and in maximizing storage. 
So in this first slide that we've got up, I'm looking at a kitchen um, that um, I designed for clients. And um, I think that we're rethinking the open floor plan because uh, I think clients want more flexibility and more functionality from their kitchens, especially because there's a new demand for home office, homework stations for children, and multi-generational occupants. So that being able to contain the kitchen is going to be something we're going to see a lot more of. Um, you're going to see where this, the, uh, there's a screen that divides and it's against the archway, um, almost like an architectural pediment. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, you'll see it closed, um, giving a great deal of flexibility for this kitchen. In fact, this client has let me know that the husband is now working at the dining table that you see in the foreground and his wife has taken over his home office because they've made her home office into the gym. So I think this is going to be the new norm where we want to be able to have flexible kitchen spaces that can be opened up and closed off um, because we have more demands on the home overall. Uh, so the next slide, um, I think we see a great example of a multi-generational usage of the kitchen. Um, you see the grandmother assisting the grandchild um, while the uh, teenager sits at the island and the parents are close by. Um, and I think this multi-level um, usage of, of the kitchen is going to mean that we're going to want to have different counter space heights um, so that everybody can participate and use the space easily and also um, to incorporate various prep areas. Um, in this slide, you see the, um, something by a company called Bloom called the Space Step. And I love it because it's a seamless way to have multiple people in the space um, and it's just a kick, uh, kick toe solution um, that pulls out so you've got extra storage um, below, but you can also allow you to install higher cabinets. And plus, it's a safe alternative to those wobbly chairs and stools that um, I know we've all probably um, tried to use before. Um, the next slide we go to, um, I'm going to talk about hygiene. And I think it's going to be key that um, sanitation in kitchens. I think we're going to see a lot of touchless elements um, like faucets um, and creating antibacteria environments so that you're not creating bacteria and the trail of breadcrumbs um, is going to um, entice bugs and mice. Um, again, touchless faucets. I think touchless garbage disposal units, anti-porous surfaces in, in, in construction mold resistant drywall and copper, copper hardware, and eliminating materials that might retain uh, bacteria. And one example as well um, is the installation of a hot water supply. Um, it not only does it speed up cooking, but it's good for cleaning and wiping down counters. Um, lastly, um, I think we'll also be seeing motion sensor for lighting controls. Um, and then in th then this next slide, um, we're looking at touchless hardware. Um, in this case, it's an electrical opening assist, which is activated by um, quick impulse of say either a knee, a hip or foot into the base cabinets. And this becomes really useful for garbage drawer where your hands might be full um, and or you can't, you're not able to pull open a drawer that has a knob or a pull on it. Um, but it also really speaks to a more hygienic kitchen. I think storage as well is going to be a key component uh, because I think um, people um, aren't going to be shopping as much. They want to have more storage, pantry storage, um, and they want to have, I, I know everyone, we've heard about everybody cleaning out their pantries. So they're going to, um, I think people are going to want to be able to have the full possibility of all the items um, will be a priority. And I think just from an emo emotional point of view, I think that having some order in a time when we're all of us are perhaps feeling we don't have a lot of control. I think that, that this is one place that I think we do have some control over. And I think as industry professionals, we are going to be asked to, um, to put those functional elements in that also help, help our clients emotionally as well. So in conclusion, um, I would say that um, for the kitchen, I would see the main points as um, having a lot of flexibility and being able to have multi-person usage, um, a focus on hygiene and um, on maximizing storage.
Great. Thank you so much. Um, let's go to uh, Leanne. Can we go to the Q&A and see what questions we have so far? Certainly. We got a few ahead of time. Uh, this one is actually for Paul. Um, this designer was saying that they do residential and home design. Are architects rethinking restaurant layouts as well? Yeah, um, I, I think so. Absolutely. Um, it's, it's definitely one of the, the biggest kind of um, challenges because economically, um, obviously square footage is, is so precious in restaurants. So the temporary solutions are to spread people out and to have less customers um, in those spaces. Um, but I, I don't see that being a long-term solution. So I think, um, I think clever usage of um, space, of laying out space so that um, servers and um, customers have uh, their, own, their own kind of pathways through restaurants. Um, there's less kind of crossover between people, uh, but they're still able to have as many uh, sim you know, similar number of people um, in the restaurant as before. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be more about uh, best practices in, in terms of um, cleaning before and after each person um, comes, to, um, comes to dine. Um, and I think that for sure, architects and designers can contribute positively to that by using, um, as I was saying before, these kind of self-cleaning um, materials um, that make it very time efficient for um, restaurant staff to not just wipe down as they do now, wipe the table, but um, go much further than that and make a whole make a whole area um, essentially bacteria free. Um, and then obviously touchless technologies in, in bathrooms, in restaurants and things like that are going to be crucial. Um, but yeah, like uh, I'm, I was an architect in, in the UK. Um, I've been a journalist now for a while. So um, I'm studying this i'm starting to see what the what the the practicing architects are currently looking at and for sure it's like very early to say for sure but um yeah i think it's going to be really interesting to see how that plays out because you know money talks and, and it's still it's still an issue um where you're going to have you know what comes first people's health people's people's businesses and livelihoods um i don't have a great you know i don't have an easy answer for that it's, it's definitely a tricky one I could add just a moment there that um, open kitchens are probably not going to be open for very long. Uh, uh, family style dining where they bring things out and uh, you often are sharing, serving yourself out of the big bowl. Uh, certain cultural things are, you know, the open Greek steam table restaurants and stuff like that, uh, all going to go away. It's going to be traditionally plated and put in front of you and possibly on disposables, which is going to be a real problem. We're running up against time, but Leanne, do we have time for one more? Well, actually, we had a, a huge surge of questions. Can we keep okay. going yeah. for, for a few minutes? And ever, Lloyd, I just... Ever, okay. Absolutely, hang with us and we'll keep going. <laughs> okay. Lloyd, I just had a comment via text that just said that your presentation was intriguing and thought-provoking and, and curious to know how this changes product design in the future. So thank you for that. Uh, we have a couple questions for Teresa. Teresa, you mentioned less uh, porosity on surfaces for the kitchen. Do you think we could have an impact for marbles on that trend? Well, I, I think we could. Um, I mean, I think that I've seen a lot more usage of, um, in, with my clients, um, not in fact using marbles and they're, they're more porous. In fact, m moving more to, um, 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 Quartz, quartzite, um, or man-made materials, and um, so I just think that there will be a resurgence, or not a resurgence, but a continuing popularity of use because they're so easy to maintain, um, and they don't have the porous elements of natural stone. Great. Here's a, here's an interesting question. Um, I think I'm going to pose it to Teresa as well. Do you see more uh, commercial kitchen and bath crossover into residential? more of a resi commercial design in light of our discussion today? Yeah, I think that's, <laughs> I, I, I think that's bang on. Um, I, I do think that, um, um, I think hygiene and cleanliness and ease is, is going to be key. But I also, I, I don't, um, um, I still think as 
um, creative people. We have to make it appealing and um, make it so that um, you want to go into your kitchen because it feels nurturing. Um, and um, so I think it's going to be a mix of extreme functionality, but, um, but also still beauty. I, I still think that that's a key to making um, people feel safe and good at home. Okay, great. Lloyd, we have a question for you. How long, based on what you, you predicted in your presentation, how long do you foresee it taking before suppliers start redesigning? Oh, God, I think there are a lot of people who are watching this who could answer that a whole lot better than me. I think Bill could answer this better than me. Like, I don't know what the turnaround cycle is. I know that the Toto introduced the first uh, B-Day seat in 1988, and it's taken, what, 30 years for them to get to where, you know, people are looking at them not strangely. Uh, so I think it takes a long time for these things to happen. I don't know, but that's for the manufacturers and the designers and the marketers more than me. Okay, great. That was a difficult question. And, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, we'll have one more question, Bill. I, this is for Paul. Do you, um, from the architectural perspective, anticipate a surge in remodeling due to adaptive spaces and reconfiguring? And Paul, just, yeah, you're on mute. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I think, um, Already before all of this, all of this happened this year, um, I think remodeling uh, adaptive reuse was on the rise anyway because of the way that cities are uh, becoming more and more dense, and um, people are kind of wary from the environmental perspective of, of building new all the time. Um, so I think it was already on the up, and this is just going to make it uh, kind of build momentum. Um, we've seen um, uh, Woods Bagot. Um, a big architecture firm here come out with a design with um, sliding walls to create office space and then hide the kitchen behind the wall and, and all this kind of thing and it, they're not new ideas but um, I think you're going to see them becoming more and more kind of commercially viable um, because the, the demand will rise um, and I think also with BIM and with modular uh, construction um, that will help drive the cost down of these kinds of um, moving elements and flexible elements. So I think that will just, um, that will just help these things um, become more and more common. Well, this, this has certainly been a fascinating discussion and we could probably continue on and on, but unfortunately we're out of time. Thank you, Paul, Lloyd and Teresa for your insights and predictions. Uh, it will be very interesting to see how the future of residential design plays out with these considerations in mind. Uh, next week, join us for a timely discussion on leadership in times of disruption. As you know, Brave New Business is live each week and was des designed really to respond to situations, events as they happen. Uh, in light of current events, we're developing programming for what promises to be a transparent and hard hitting discussion. So we hope you'll tune in. Thanks again to our panel and for all of you for making time to join us. Please follow NKBA and me on social media for the latest news and updates from the kitchen and bath industry. We'll see you all next week. Thank you. Bye.